on World News Tonight. Russia strikes back. The Russian Federation launches two large-scale attacks on Kyiv in less than 24 hours. Kosovo in turmoil. NATO soldiers injured in Kosovo clashes with Serb protesters as violence escalates further. A new space race? The DPRK announces a launch date for their new military satellite. What does this mean for its neighbours? Find out tonight. And the doggo fantasy. Luminous pups take a walk for responsible dog ownership in Chile. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News as we bring to you news from across the globe. The war in Ukraine is on our top story tonight. Now after facing heavy missile and drone attacks over the weekend, Ukraine's capital Kyiv came under another wave of attacks from Russia. Yesterday's attacks were also the first to take place in daylight, hours in the capital in months. Russia also issued an arrest warrant for U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham over comments on the war as Moscow continued an intensive air assault on Kyiv. Russia has been ramping up assaults on the Ukrainian capital Kyiv this month. On Sunday, Kyiv faced heavy missile and drone attacks, and again on Monday, the capital came under another wave of attacks from Russia, this time during daytime hours. According to the Ukrainian military, Russia fired dozens of cruise missiles from strategic bombers stationed in the Caspian Sea. While most of the missiles were shot down, the attacks killed four and injured 25 others in the city in the two days of the assault. The latest attack on the capital was all the more concerning as it marked the first daytime attack in the area in months while streets were full of people going to work and school. The daytime assault followed a massive Russian air attack using drones the previous day. Ukraine says it shot down 58 out of the 59 drones used to attack the capital on Sunday. And with Moscow using Iranian-made drones, Ukraine's parliament voted in favor of a proposal to impose additional sanctions against Iran to stop the transit of Iranian products through Ukrainian territory. Ukraine says Iran has supplied Russia with so-called kamikaze drones, which have been used to target Ukrainian infrastructure, leading to civilian deaths. While Russia has so far launched 16 assaults on Kyiv this month, the Kyiv Regional Military Administration says Moscow seems to be changing its tactics, demonstrating its will to attack the civilian population. President Alexander put the Serbian army on the highest level of combat alert after around 25 NATO peacekeeper soldiers defending three town halls in northern Kosovo were injured in clashes with Serbs as they protested against the ethnic Albanian mayors. Loud bangs echoed through the air as Serbian protesters clashed with NATO peacekeeping soldiers on Monday in the town of Zvechan in Kosovo. About 25 soldiers were injured while defending its town hall, as well as those in two other locations. The NATO-led mission said it condemned the violence. Two Serbs were also injured, according to Serbian state TV. The tense situation developed after ethnic Albanian mayors took office in northern Kosovo's Serb-majority area. The U.S. and its allies, which have strongly backed the country's independence, rebuked Kosovo for the move last week. Serbs boycotted the local elections, and some saw a turnout of 3.5 percent. The Serbs are demanding that the Kosovo government remove ethnic Albanian mayors from town halls and allow local administrations financed by Belgrade to resume their work. Serbia's President Aleksandar Vucic put the army on the highest level of alert, while urging Serbs in Kosovo not to get entangled in conflict. I am urging the Serbs in Kosovo, and I know how they feel and how difficult it is for them, not to get in a conflict with NATO. Kosovo's president has accused Vucic of destabilizing the country. But Igor Simic, the deputy head of the biggest Belgrade-backed Kosovo Serb party, says it's actually the other way around. Ethnic Albanians make up more than 90 percent of the population in Kosovo as a whole. But Serbs comprise a majority in the north. They've never accepted its 2008 declaration of independence from Serbia and still see Belgrade as their capital more than two decades after the Kosovo-Albanian uprising against repressive Serbian rule. 
Japan put its ballistic missile defenses on alert and vowed to shoot down any projectile that threatens its territory after North Korea notified it of a planned satellite launch between May 31st and June 11th. Japan put its ballistic missile defenses on alert on Monday and warned it would shoot down any projectile that threatened its territory after North Korea notified it of a satellite launch between Wednesday, May 31st and June 11th. North Korea says it has completed its first military spy satellite, and leader Kim Jong-un has approved final preparations for the launch. Analysts say the satellite is part of a surveillance technology program, which includes drones, and is aimed at helping nuclear-armed North Korea to strike targets in the event of war. Japan's defense ministry said in a statement it would use its standard missile 3, or Patriot missile Pac-3, to destroy a North Korean missile. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida told reporters such a launch would be a serious violation of UN Security Council resolutions condemning North Korea's nuclear and missile activity. South Korea also called on the North to scrap the planned launch. And China's foreign ministry called for dialogue to ease the escalating tensions. Reclusive North Korea has conducted a series of missile launches and weapons tests in recent months, including a new solid-fuel intercontinental ballistic missile. Japan expects Pyongyang to fire the rocket carrying its satellite over the southwest island chain, as it did in 2016, a defense ministry spokesperson said. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez called a snap election in an apparent attempt to wrong-foot his conservative opponents and give his flagging Socialist Party the best chance of retaining power before its support weakens further. It's an unexpected move from Spain's Prime Minister. After the victory of the right-wing opposition in local and regional elections on Sunday, Pedro Sanchez, head of the ruling left-wing coalition government, called a snap general election for the 23rd of July, five months before the next election is due to be held. Even if the vote yesterday had a regional and local effect, the meaning of this vote sends us a message that goes beyond this. So as the head of the government and of the Socialist Party, I take responsibility for the results, and I think it is necessary to respond and submit our democratic mandate to the popular will. Sunday's vote saw the People's Party win in regions including Valencia, the Balearic Islands and Aragon, which were previously secured by Sanchez's Socialist Workers' Party. It also gained absolute majorities in the Madrid region and city council. But since the People's Party did not gain majorities in many of the newly won regions, it will need to negotiate with the far-right anti-immigration Vox Party to form local and regional governments. According to some analysts, Sanchez, who has been in office since 2018, plans to capitalise on the fear of the People's Party uniting with Vox at a national level in order to rally voters. His call for an election was welcomed by the leader of the People's Party. I want to thank the majority of Spaniards who yesterday sent out a very strong message about the direction they want our country to take. Today, I ask for the support of the citizens to be the next president of the government of Spain. Sanchez's coalition government has put Spain's economy on par with some of the fastest growing in the EU and introduced seminal new laws, including menstrual leave. The setback comes just weeks before Spain is due to take over EU presidency on July the 1st. A handful of hard-right Republican lawmakers said that they would oppose a deal to raise the United States' $31.4 trillion debt ceiling in a sign that the bipartisan agreement could face a rocky path through Congress before the U.S. runs out of money next week. With less than a week left until the U.S. runs out of money if Congress fails to raise or suspend the $31 trillion debt ceiling, Democratic President Joe Biden and Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy appeared upbeat Monday that both chambers of Congress will pass their tentative deal, hammered out over the weekend, and prevent what Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has called the unthinkable from happening. Biden said he had been working the phones to get lawmakers on his side. Look, you know I never say I'm confident what the Congress is going to do, but I feel very good about it. I spoke to a number of the members, I spoke to McConnell, I spoke to uh, a whole bunch of people. And it feels good, we'll see when the vote starts. 
After weeks of tough negotiations, the crucial test now comes on Tuesday. That's when the House Rules Committee takes up the bill. McCarthy predicts most of his fellow Republicans, who control the House 222 to 213, will support suspending the debt ceiling. House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries also says he expects support from his side, although also some on the far left to vote no as well. And at least two hard-right Republicans McCarthy appointed to the Rules Committee, the price he paid to secure his position as House Speaker, say they do not support the bill. Representative Chip Roy wrote on Twitter that there were, quote, no serious substantive policy reforms. Another panel member, Ralph Norman, called the deal insanity, as the spending cuts don't go far enough. The bill would suspend the debt limit through January 2025 and set aside the politically risky issue until after the 2024 presidential election. It also claws back unused COVID relief, caps government spending and raises the defence budget. The financial markets responded mostly positively on Monday to the prospects of a Biden-McCarthy deal, seeing it as a path to avert potential chaos on a massive scale if the U.S. was unable to make payments on its securities. But some investors are wary that the spending cuts secured by McCarthy could drag down U.S. growth. Investors are also bracing for potential volatility in the U.S. bond market, as the Treasury is expected to quickly refill its empty coffers by issuing bonds once the debt ceiling is raised. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now, as start start this week on a global plastic treaty, debate is emerging between countries wanting to limit the production of more plastics and the petrochemical industry favouring recycling as a solution to plastic waste. As talks start in Paris this week on a global plastics treaty, a divide is emerging on how to deal with plastic pollution. Between countries that want to restrict production of plastic and the petrochemicals industry, which says recycling is the answer. A 55-nation coalition called for a strong treaty that restricted certain hazardous chemicals and banned problematic plastic products that are hard to recycle and often end up in nature. Inger Anderson heads the United Nations Environment Programme, which is hosting the talks. Please bear in mind that only elimination, reduction, a full life cycle approach, transparency and a just transition only those can bring success, because the truth is that we cannot recycle our way out of this mess. Recycling infrastructure is unable to cope with today's volumes. Greenpeace unveiled an artwork in Paris in the shape of a machine churning out bottles in front of an oil derrick. Many countries say the treaty's goal should be circularity, or keeping already produced plastic items in circulation as long as possible. UNEP has released a blueprint for reducing plastic waste by 80% by 2040. It outlined three key areas of action, reuse, recycling and reorientation of plastic packaging to alternative materials. But some environmental groups criticised the report for focusing on waste management, which they saw as a concession to the global plastics and petrochemicals industry. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni signed one of the world's toughest anti-LGBTQ laws, including the death penalty for aggravated homosexuality, drawing Western condemnation and risking sanctions from aid donors. Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni has signed one of the world's toughest anti-LGBTQ laws, which includes the death penalty. Same-sex relations were already illegal in Uganda, as in more than 30 African countries. But the new law goes much further. The move has drawn Western condemnation and could risk some of the billions in foreign aid that Uganda receives. It stipulates capital punishment for so-called serial offenders against the law and transmission of a terminal illness like HIV AIDS through gay sex. It also decrees a 20-year sentence for, quote, promoting homosexuality. Activists have vowed a legal challenge to the law. Ugandan activist Dilovi Papadi Kwagala said the law could do harm beyond the country's borders. Museveni has called homosexuality a deviation from normal and urged lawmakers to resist imperialist pressure. He had insisted lawmakers tone down parts of the law, but his ultimate approval was not seen as in doubt. 
anti-LGBTQ attitudes have hardened in conservative Uganda in recent years, in part due to campaigning by Western evangelical church groups. Washington and the European Union have condemned the bill. The UN and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS said the law put Uganda's fight against HIV in grave jeopardy. We have some good news for you. Bio Inc. is the key technology behind generating artificial tissue for the human body. And South Korean researchers have come up with the latest version where bone tissue is regenerated before biodegrading in the body naturally when its work is done. The bio industry has been hard at work trying to develop 3D printing technology capable of creating artificial tissue for the human body. The challenge has been developing a bio ink that is safe for humans. The risk of toxicity is high when using chemicals and ultraviolet rays, which means there would need to be external culturing of cells that then need to be transplanted into the body, furthering the risks of side effects. Developing this bioink technology has remained in its research stages and so far has not been successful in reaching the clinical testing stage. But now a team of Korean researchers has developed bioink that can hold a stable structure through temperature control. At body temperature, its form hardens to a gel-like structure. This new bioink printed part helps regenerate tissue cells, then biodegrades in the body after a certain period of time. Not only is it easy to print in various shapes, but its greatest advantage is that it doesn't need ultraviolet rays to hold its structure. The research team tested this technology on a mouse with a damaged skull. In eight weeks, the bioink printed support structure helped the bones regenerate to normal tissue levels, and the structure itself had started its slow biodegradation. We could see the bioink slowly biodegrade by the 42nd day, and comparing the fourth and eighth weeks, we could see the bones regenerate. Existing bioink required an additional injection of stem cells, which increased the risk of side effects on the immune system. But this newly developed bioink stimulates the regeneration of tissues and not cells, so it can be used to treat any orthopedic patient. The bioink has the ability to attract stem cells within the body to regenerate desired tissue growth without an injection of external stem cells. The research team says the bioink is being prepared for clinical trials at a local bioventure company and expects this technology to be commercialized as early as three years from now. They also plan further research into using the bioink not only for bone tissue regeneration, but also for it to be used for skin and organ tissue regeneration. Egyptian antiquities authorities unveiled ancient workshops and tombs that they say were discovered recently at a pharaonic necropolis just outside the capital Cairo. The spaces were found in the sprawling necropolis of Saqqara, which is a part of Egypt's ancient capital of Memphis. Seen by human eyes for the first time in millennia, Within the vast Saqqara necropolis just south of the capital Cairo, archaeologists have discovered two human and animal embalming rooms in Egypt. It was on these stone slabs that the dead were mummified, with the practice also covering sacred animals like cats and crocodiles. Also unearthed two tombs, one of which belongs to Ney Hezard Bar, head of the scribes to the 5th dynasty around 4,500 years ago. Untouched for thousands of years, the colors are almost as bright as the day they were painted. The paintings and inscriptions on the tomb are so amazing. They represent his religious and secular life. Because of his titles, we can see scenes of agriculture, harvesting, grazing, sacrificial slaughtering and ranching. All of those scenes are in the tomb. This site once served as the Egyptian capital. Back then it was called Memphis. Today, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and home to the oldest pyramid known. With over a dozen points of interest within the complex, the modern-day Egyptian government is hoping that this site and others like it prove to be enough of a draw to lure in millions of tourists. Cairo is pinning its hopes on a tourism injection to boost its sluggish economy and for levels to surpass those pre-pandemic. Around 13 million people came to the country before COVID, the government is looking to up that to 30 million within the next five years. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute.
China sent three astronauts to its now fully operational space station as part of a crew rotation in the fifth manned mission to the Chinese space outposts in 2021. Kafour peacekeepers were seen putting up barriers and guarding municipal buildings a day after violent clashes erupted between troops and Serb protesters again. Nigeria's new leader Bola Ahmed Tinubu was sworn in as the 16th president of the most populous African nation after taking the oath of office at a ceremony in Abuja, capital of Nigeria. The remains of three people who perished in the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD had recently been unearthed during a recent dig in Pompeii. The skeletal remains are believed to have belonged to two women and a child aged around three or four who died while seeking shelter from the devastating eruption in the bakery. Vietnam's capital of Hanoi have been turning off street lights partially to keep the national power system running amid record rising temperatures that brought a surge in electricity demand in some parts of the Southeast Asian nation. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we wrap up with the dozens of dogs donning luminous collars embarked on a walk down the streets of Santiago in an effort to advocate to raise awareness for responsible dog ownership. Stay safe and have a good night.